into the last chapter in this book also. And there is chapter, chapter eight. eight. Yeah. Baptist in South Africa. South Africa. The it came a little bit later. Hmm? Um, we talk about here. Um, yeah, well, it's not so much later. You see, the Baptist in South Africa arrived in the eight, um, 1820. 1820 centers, really? but that's the centers. It's yeah. not the Baptist really? No. Yet they were few in number and without a minister. William Miller took the lead in holding the first Baptist service in South Africa. Um, they divided into particular and general Baptists when they start. Immediately they were a division. <laughs> <laughs> um, Calvinistic and Armenian yeah, in their yeah. theology. And well, you see again how many times this thing comes back. Uh, and because we treat the fruits and not the cause of the problem. Um, and uh, we need to ask the questions, not what is the right uh, theology, but why and what values are involved? And what belief systems are beneath it? Exactly. And, that's and that's go and that. fix the brick on the there. Start That's why I don't buy either. I mean, who was there before them? <laughs> <laughs> there was the Bible. <laughs> exactly. God, God himself. And, and why, how do we know him? We, we talk to him each day and he answers us. We know something of, of him day by day. We learn to know his amazing ways of doing things and uh, his amazing way of feeling, his amazing ways of thinking. Um, we don't understand him totally, but and we understand it deep in his heart. Mm. You see that that thing is also helped me but you see. If we say that's God and we cannot understand him totally. Sometimes we say, okay, but then we understand that outer part of God. Mm. See, but that's where we're wrong. Mm. God gave the center of his heart to us. Mm. So we understand this part of See, there's a big part we That's interesting the way you find it. That that that's that's very true. That's that, me. That, that that is Yo, I never thought of it that way. But what we understand of him is in the centre of his heart we know something about him. He didn't only reveal to us his outside, he revealed mm. his inside to us. So it's like a cake into the centre of God himself. And we, we are busy with this process each day by like talking to him, yeah. experiencing him, making mistakes, and sharing it with him and see how he reacts. It's just I've been dealing with theology in, in, yeah. in that sense. That's why it's very, very interesting. Because I'm also more interested in God's heart behind theology than the theology itself. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and if you don't see that, that center of God, you've missed it. And he tells us in the Bible of human relations what is the center. And he says, I love. Mm. And I experience it is not a work um, that I have some semantic value to. Mm. It's a the relationship with him that, that love. Mm. And I, I feel it and I can see it and I can live with it and I can react to it and it's reacting to me in it. So I learn that thing deeper and deeper. I don't uh, actually know more and more things, mm -hmm. but I know this thing deeper and deeper. And more and more things <laughs> open up. <laughs> yeah. And you start seeing his heart behind more and more and things. You, later on, you can go into the most difficult situation, in the deepest darkness, and you can smile because you know it. Yeah. You seem to his heart, you know it. So you can smile in the most difficult, darkest place. Um, so, uh, and so, again, I mean, if you struggle with theology and all of these things, it is superficial. Hmm. Um, we need to go back to that, to how deep, where was the, the Armenian thing, for example. Hmm. If you really understand your, your relationship with God, where day by day, you know for sure, you couldn't add anything to this that I'm receiving. I mean, 
you will understand the Armenian thing is not not what God is saying to me. <laughs> yeah. So no, let's teach our members a relationship with God. Yeah. And the problem, the fruit will be different. <coughs> the values will be different. The acts will be different. And the consequences will be different. Yeah. And then, so, with your mindsets, I love, I, I need to work with that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's because the, the tree's roots are under the ground, it's not visible. Yeah. If you want to work with it, you have to dig it up. Because people don't think of their worldview. Yeah. But that's where things change. So you need to open it up. The no, worldview is the place, in the biggest part. In yes. so that, is, that is, when people say, the church need to do spiritual things. That's the closest that I get to spiritual things is by helping people to open up their roots, mm. to find out what on what they what they believe and what they use to live from. Because you don't think of it. Mm. You need people to help you to open it up, to see, yeah. to understand it so that you can make your choices yourself. Not you, anyone else can't make your choices, but you can help him see. Hmm. So, he goes. Um, so, they say, which brought about a schism um, in the very, very first Baptist church in Grahamstown. A division that took many years to reconcile, and many doubt, uh, doubtless hampered and early. Uh, yeah, it hampered the early growth of the Baptists in South Africa. Um, then 1857, there was 2,400 German soldiers, soldiers who had fought for the British and the Crimean War were permitted to settle in the Eastern Cape. Yeah, among the, the settlers were some Baptists who made application to Johan Onken. Now, you remember one? I remember Onken, yeah. The, the great missionary, mm. the one who just had the passion for missions. I mean, <laughs> you can't go wrong if you do that. Yeah. And he immediately became the one that they look at. And uh, application to Johan Onkan in Germany for a minister. Onkan sent out to them in 1867, Ichuk Kutsche, who became one of the most significant pioneers in Baptist in South Africa. 1867. Um, so, yeah, it is not far out of this, so in this right here, 1867, and we say RSA. You won't understand this anymore, but if you can make your own timeline, you can take a photo of this if you want to, and make your own timeline, um, you can fit the dates and the things that you can take That's what I wanted to do in the beginning, but it didn't work out that way. Just a quick one on, on Unken, um, something very interesting, if you read the seven letters in Revelation, yeah. and there's only two letters where Jesus had no issue, there were only two churches, he had no issue with them. Yeah. It's the <laughs> Missions Church and the Persecuted Church. My father loved that seven congregations and the way that it was written in there. Uh, <laughs> so interesting. Um, so interesting. <laughs> their requirements were not demanding that he... Uh, so, <laughs> uh, such men do not grow on apple trees, nor are they produced in a baker as a pr baker produces loaves of bread. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's the, the importance of finding the persons who are called for the job. Um, we can say a lot of that, but I think we, are, we, need, we need to finish. Within 25 years, he built 25 churches, church buildings, please, not churches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every one, everyone free of debt when opened. Mm. Um, so, people from the beginning knew that they are responsible and they are, mm. need to have generosity. Mm. And that's a very important thing which a lot of us don't understand. Uh, missions. Mm -hmm. You know, you know there's, 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 in Acts 2, that was part of, there was only a couple of, I think it was five principles that this church was was, was following. Yeah. 
And because of those five principles that they were following, God added the numbers to the church. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that generosity yeah. was, was a big, I mean, I think it was mentioned three times in that passage. Yeah. Three times. And they shared with yeah. one another. And they used all that, that part where Ruth, for example, was mm. dropped some Drop of the yeah. <laughs> grain, not picking it up. Yeah. The, the cure for souls in the gravest task is the gravest task of the minister. May God have mercy on me, should I take this lightly. Hmm. You see his attitude, how heavy this burden rests on me. Um, and that's, you mean, if you talk about passion, everyone who did great things had the passion. And God is giving us passion for something. We just need to say, uh, oh, that some would help and understand. I have to give an account of my work before God. My own salvation is involved. If I do not faithfully preach the truth, if, if thing, something um, some think other preachers would make it easier to follow Christ, then let them go. I am bound to proclaim the gospel, not counting the cost. I, I just wanted to mention that because that was his attitude, and that's why I think the Lord used him so, so extensively. And you can see here his fear of, of failure mm -hmm. in what he says. That's part of his motivation. <laughs> um, a passion, a zeal, what is it? Um, I'm asking the question. Instead, the fact that German and English Baptists were able to come together in the Baptist Union, it is a testimony of the patient sacrifice and vision of Okuchan. So at the end, he had a union there and they had both the different Baptist churches uh, joined uh, willingly. The German churches practice a closed membership and a closed table. Uh, the English churches, on the other hand, generally favor the open table, so they have this different churches with different languages, welcoming all believers to Holy Communion and some of them even an open membership. You can be a member, you know, taking into membership believers who have not received believers' baptism. So it was very the uh, English churches was very really open, while the German churches with their perfectionistic view of things said no. It's a closed table, it's a closed membership. Gucci was, was a champion of unity, received much criticism, and at one stage was refused communion in one of the German churches. Such things pained him very deeply, but he persevered in promoting uh, the welfare of both the fellow German Baptist and wider family represented by the Baptist Union. So he was more of the way of the open. Um, and then it says something about the believers and developments. And the first Afrikaans Baptist Church was established in 1886 by Udendal, J.D. Udendal. He studied in Stellenbosch to prepare for the Dutch Reformed Ministry. Yeah, doubts, however, about the valid, uh, val validity of infant baptism, and he changed. Um, then Urendal was ordained by the German Baptists and became a leader of the first Afrikaans Baptist Church in South Africa. So you can see now uh, how they started, the first uh, theological differences, and then the Germans coming in, then the language differences, and also they had different one was more closed and one was more open and now in the German ones that within the Afrikaans one also starts just to see how we developed Baptists in Southern Africa were concerned to impact the gospel of the indigenous people of the land so they have a mission heart also they had a mission heart the first to do so was a German farmer uh, Karl Pape who had learned to speak Tosa fluently so he is not the pastor or the leader, it was a farmer. As a member he started. After having a dream in which he was a native, had sinking into the waves while hands were stretched out appealing for help. 
the Lord of Dream through a dream. Listen to the stories. He felt called to preach the gospel to the Troza people. In this work he was greatly encouraged by Hukunche, who persuaded the German churches to recognize his ministry. So he first had to fight to be recognized, but the leader saw his gift in helping him, the normal member, to be recognized in a ministry. And he managed to do it. Officially in 1868 he was recognized. The work of Pope and Butcher played an important role in the formation of South African Baptist Missionary Society. So then they started the whole Baptist Missionary Society in 1892. And that's I think it's one of the biggest steps of the church in any case. You start to be involved in her calling. 1892. Um, it's, we can say a lot of, we have a lot of criticism on why, how they did it. It should not be a society in the church which is a small group of people doing the mission work in the name of all the others. It should actually be each member being involved in missions. But in any case, the, that they did that and have a heart for it and accepted it was already something great. Um, so an acute labor shortage in Natal led to an immigration of about 150,000 Indians to Natal. And uh, indentured laborers between 1860 and 1911, less than 2% of these were Christians. And um, of these again, only few were Baptists. Um, and they, but they wrote a letter and they requested for a Baptist minister. So there was a Baptist minister, uh, John Rangia, um, who labored faithfully until his death in 1912. His first convert in Natal was a Telugu speaking man named Subadur who was awaiting execution for murder. <laughs> so that was his first convert. <laughs> a murderer. <laughs> With uh, uh, characteristic patience and persuasion, he won the heart of the condemned man. And Subadu was baptized in the prison bath. <laughs> Interesting stories. We need to read more about this. Hmm. And no more. We don't have time to go through it quickly. But, um, but you can see this, again, it is not our story, it's his but story. story. It's we just play the parts. <laughs> all of our corruption and all of our struggles, he's still doing his, building his church. Yeah. C.M. Doak, the Doak family is one of the, of which South African Baptists can be justified, justifiably proud of. Oh, okay. Shared the vision of William Carey. Now you can also see the missionaries. They, their vision and their passion just created sometimes churches. It's amazing. To, to extend the knowledge of Christ to regions beyond. In 1913, he went on a missionary exploration tour for the Copper Belt, that's in, in Zambia, in northern Rhodesia, today Zambia, accompanied by his son, Clement Martin, tragically struck. Um, and J.J. Doak died of enteric, I don't know what that is, on the journey back. But the outcome of the report given to the following Baptist Union Assembly in 1913 was that C.N. Doak and the missionary couple were sent to the Lum Lumba Land Field in northern Rhodesia. From 1914 to 21, he served as a missionary. So the passion of the one he came back, gave report, and he touched the heart of somebody else, and he went and was sent officially by the, the, the church. Doug was also involved in the launching of the Baptist Theological College in South Africa in 1951. Huh. So then they started in 1951. I think that is also a new day. <coughs> Theological College. So that's in STEM. Uh, theology in South Africa. Started in 1951. Then also William Duma, a Zulu pastor in, in the uh, Baptist Church 
was also a name that can be remembered. <coughs> he founded no no one. He founded no new denomination. His theological training was rudimentary, and his command of English limited. He spent most of his life as a humble pastor of one congregation, but there was a spiritual depth to the simple Zulu pastor that singled him out as an extraordinary servant of Christ. Nice words to see, to hear. Um, he didn't do great things. And then where he stayed and worked, he, he did extraordinary servant, servant uh, tasks. Yeah, and they tell a bit about his life. He invents a deep seriousness concerning the things of God. He was troubled with God with continual illnesses and health also in his life. Hmm. And at the age of 20 he decided to fast and pray for seven days. During these days his dominant desire to be healed was replaced by a greater longing that God himself should be the utmost fullness of his desire. So he, in his fasting he changed from his need to be healed to just to, to know God. At midnight on the seventh day of the fast, unhealed, unhealed, he rose to pray. Some time later he felt a touch on his head and knew it as the finger of God. And the experience of heat caused him to sweat profusely and he collapsed, felt the surge of cold follow the heat and realized that his pain was gone. Convinced that God has touched him, Duma determined to rise every midnight for the rest of his life in order to pray. For the rest of his life, 12, 12 o'clock at night, he stood up and prayed to God. And you can say a lot of what is happening, mm -hmm. but look at the people around him, how they would experience a man loving God so real and standing up 12 o'clock each night and praying. It will do something to the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the prayers themselves. You know. He became a cook in a boarding house um, of a Christian woman, Mr. Stewart, Mrs. Stewart, who arranged for him to attend Bible class. And he had a remarkable gift of healing through prayer. Yeah. And returning from his hilltop retreat to Mary, uh, he commenced a five day campaign. On, on his very first night, extraordinary things occurred in the back church. Five women who, who began screaming and behaving in a wild manner were exhausted by demons, by Duma. Exorcism became a significant part of his ministry. Indeed, for the rest of his life, Duma's ministry was characterized by powerful encounters with sin, sickness, and Satan and realms of the supernatural. Um, one member of the prayer circle who became very close to Duma was an Indian Anglican priest, Father Francis, whose wife had been healed through Duma after a long and deliberating disease for which no medical cure could be found. Father Francis bore witness that his own ministry and the parish of St. Aidens were revitalized through the association with the Wednesday prayer circle of a lot of experiences and testimonies and remarkable events of healings that happened. And he had a heart attack in 1976, it slowed him down temporarily, but soon he was back on his pulpit and renewed zeal. Renewed zeal. Mm. After a baptismal uh, service in Guinea Road, he was taken ill and died in October 1977. Um, then the Baptist Convention and Union Baptist early 20th century missionary policy in most Protestant circles was to establish separate churches for native converts with a view to promoting self-reliance and self-government. Thus it was that Baptist African converts were gathered into separate association through affiliation with the Baptist Union. So they also started different cultural churches. Um, association consisting briefly of different cultural groups. The, the blacks and the colors and the Indians and the African Baptist formed in the African Baptist Church. Um, it was inconsistent with gospel principles of unity and equality in Christ. 
Most denominations took steps to integrate all their churches and members into one body. In 1986, the convention decided uh, to sever its ties with the union, uh, discontinue any merger talks and establish itself as a separate denomination. Um, yeah. This was done but not without considerable bitterness and wrangling over property rights and some other issues. Fortunately, this initial period of bitterness and accusation was replaced by the spirit of reconciliation and relations later improved between the two bodies. You see, this is um, uh, this was in this in the apartheid uh, mm. time, time. Um, and it had effect on the Christians, and they separated also with bitterness, and mm. that's part of, the, of our history. Mm. Um, Despite these differences, relationships between the conventions and the Union are characterized by cordiality and some degree of cooperation started. Um, okay, but it's still a, the issue in all the denominations in South Africa. Hmm. Not a simple issue, that's my words now, it's not in the book. <coughs> With languages and cultural differences, it's not a simple issue. Mm -hmm. it is, it's not easy. But this is some of the things that we still need to write the history mm -hmm. to see how where it will go. We are the writers. God is writing through us the history, his story. At a time when, when many mainline churches were declining, Baptists continued to grow. Okay, so that's more or less where we are today. So, uh, I think uh, the different cultures still have this different unions and mm. we, yeah, At the moment, we are. Um, but as I said, there are. We some are. Things in, yes, there is cultures, cultures coming into. We can go to any of the churches. Um, if you want to go to a church that you understand the language, you're welcome. But we are here, especially in Cape Town, I know the fact we are. Intervening, we've got all types of things to do that. Where we don't have the answer to it. Mm. No, the denominations, no, I think, no, each other no. are struggling with this. Yeah. There are some denominations who are really integrated. Yes. Which is nice to see. Mm. They help us. Yeah. But we, we don't have a, a, a good answer. Yeah, it's difficult to sit in to go to the church where you don't understand the language and so yeah. Um, and doing things differently. Yes. Um, there are different ways of doing things and so on. There are differences. And we need to be very honest about it. Yeah. We need to talk about it and we need to find a way. way. Yeah. Because it's totally unbiblical. Not yes. to have no, unity. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we also not to have unity with error. So. Yeah, yeah, but that, yeah, that doctrinal is, error. Doctrinal yeah. error. No, it's true. So it's not a, it's not a easy. It's not easy.